I'm Christian Manderfield, and this is my Sinclair C5. Brainchild of Britain's own Sir Clive Sinclair and an icon of the mid-1980s. To some, the C5 was a freak of evolution that became victim of natural selection. But to others, it was a work of genius, light years ahead of its time. A new electric vehicle. The long-awaited Sinclair electric car. I mean, how do you drive it? Where are the controls? Under your thighs. There's a handlebar under the thighs. The three-wheeler has a top speed of 15 miles an hour. Anyone over 14 can drive one without a license. It's an electric car. It's not. It's really a futuristic tricycle with an electric motor. For months, I had been planning a journey to push my C5 to its limits and take it on the trip of its life. What kind of man dreams up such a machine? And why do people continue to love it, despite the cruel sniggering that accompanies its every move? First, I must go back to see the empire that spawned the C5. I will head to nearby Cambridge, where things really started to get interesting for Clive. Get your motor running. Head out on the highway. Looking for adventure. Clive began life in Richmond. He was clearly sharper than most of the tools in Surrey and soon outgrew that particular pond with his ambitious and inventive nature. Clearly a mind such as his was more at home in Cambridge. Clive moved to this street in Cambridge and it is here where most of the parts for his earlier products were assembled. In 1967, Clive had gone miniature mad. Having had success with tiny radios and the first pocket calculator, Clive had another miniature world's first, the portable TV. Unfortunately, while Clive was busy designing cathode ray tubes which would fit into his pocket, some clued up kids in Japan had come up with the LCD screen. Clive was clearly driven by the will for invention and market research never really extended much beyond his gut instinct. Inevitably, his products were a little bit hit and miss, but by the time he left Cambridge, his reputation was secure. A few years later, Clive would return to this very pub and confront Chris Curry, head of rival business Acorp. Upset that Chris had said some rather rude things about his computers, Clive acted as only a true gentleman could and hit him over the head with a rolled-up newspaper. Clive was now rich and very successful. Time to head to a special place on the south coast. Born to be wild. Born to be wild. Enrico Tedeschi has one of every Clive Sinclair invention. A framed photo and some candles and it would be a veritable shrine. Having produced the first pocket television, Sir Clive uh, decided to uh, produce a flat screen television. Yeah. Here we have some um, ZX80 prototypes, then came the ZX81, and these are prototypes of a spectrum with um, display. And Sir Clive was one of the first to, to put uh, a hand calculator in everybody's um, pocket. He's obsessed with small stuff. This is the ominously titled Black Watch, a significant failure in the history of this great company. Losses meant that Sinclair Radionics ceased to exist, but the Clive Sinclair roller coaster still had one more all-time high. Clive moved to the big smoke of London and formed a new company, Sinclair Research. <laughs> Clive's finest hour was, without doubt, his gargantuan onslaught on the home computer market. Here, at the Wembley Computer Fair, during the dawn of the 1980s, he launched the ZX80, and several models later, he had defined an industry. His computers were a great success. Affordable, functional, and most importantly of all, they had ace games. Never one to rest on success, Clive had bigger plans in mind. He saw a new goal, brighter, bolder and more brilliant than anything that had gone before. Something that would revolutionise transport forever. Clive 
only been interested in electric transport. Always seeming to enjoy public acclaim beyond financial success, it's no wonder that he aspired to be the one who banished the petrol car to the history books. In 1980, research into the C5 stepped up a gear. This career-long dream was about to come into startling fruition. The slow-turning wheels of electrical transport had been set into motion, and nothing was going to stop them! There is one great problem with electric cars that no one has yet solved. Batteries just don't deliver as much power as petrol. Of course, if you're a genius, you don't let little things like that bother you. But what's the fun in making batteries? Time would be better spent ensuring the thing looked like it had just flown here from the year 3000. During the 1980s, there was one true authority on cutting-edge technology, and that was the great BBC institution, Tomorrow's World. Judith Han was the presenter, who had the pleasure of introducing the C5 to the unsuspecting public. Well, we all thought it was a bit wacky. The high-tech tricycles. I did actually drive it myself around the studio. We built a ramp and I had to take it uphill and <laughs> round and about. But to me, it was just small. Open-topped and slow. I didn't feel convinced of its reliability. They have a very limited range and performance. And I also felt very vulnerable in it. There have been some worries voiced about its safety. Mm. Um, I wouldn't really fancy driving around London in it. Here at Alexandra Palace, the C5 was launched in all its electrical glory on the 10th of January 1985. It had a top speed of 15 miles per hour, which meant that anyone over 14 years old could drive it without a licence. It was lightweight and it could go a distance of 20 miles on a full battery charge. There was no need for road tax and it looked like a spaceship. The dream was here and it was yours for only £399. With bated breath, the press and the public awaited its launch. The revolutionary C5, launched in January, has had a bumpy Even start. Even before the first Sinclairs took to the streets, it's been criticised on safety grounds. They came under attack. Its critics are already predicting chaos on Sales the road. Have been dismal. Has already run into heavy criticism about its safety. 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 Like whoever brought out that, well, got to putting up a wall and shooting. Oh, uh, we, we had some technical uh, teething problems because when we brought it out, um, it was the middle of winter and the batteries didn't have much of a range in the very cold weather. Uh, that wasn't the real problem. The real problem was, was twofold. It, first of all, it got a very bad press. But the other thing I think was that um, it's a fine vehicle for, um, you know, sort of bicycle lanes or, or selected areas. But it's really a bit frightening, I think, the concept of being on, a, on, a, on an ordinary road with it. Uh, what areas of invention are aspiring your work at the moment? Well, transport, really, mostly. Um, I am still interested in sort of possibility of flying transport, flying machines, and we're looking at a lot of a sort of range of electric vehicles. We've been developing new electric motors for that. Oh, right. Will that be the C10 and the C15? Um, that sort of thing, yes. Yes, in due course, yes. So now, on to Merthyr Tydfil, the unfortunate location in the south of Wales that became the home of the C5. The electric trike was manufactured there by Hoover, a company better known for washing machine motors. They were gifted the contract for a projected 200,000 vehicles per year. Before we progress any further, one thing should be straightened out. Whatever Clive would have you believe, electric cars are not new. In 1902, the Phaeton was created. It was an electric car with a range of 18 miles and a top speed of 14 miles per hour. Sound familiar? By the 1920s, better roads meant that cars needed a longer range, and so gasoline cars were considered the future of motoring. The electric car was left in the dust, waiting for someone to resurrect it. Waiting for someone to reinvent the Phaeton in the shape of a large white shoe and set it free once again on the open roads. So what exactly went wrong with the C5? Well, you may have noticed that I left Cambridge two days ago, and I've only just reached Wales and I've had exhaust fumes blowing in my face for most of the journey. The 15 mile per hour top speed turned out to be a bit ambitious. 
as did the 20 mile range. <coughs> Safety concerns also are a major issue. The height means that I'm about eye level with a juggernaut's wheel. Despite Clive's claims that the C5 could hit anything with tremendous force and just bounce back, most customers were more concerned with how their heads would bounce in such an incident. James Ty of the British Safety Council can consider his hands most blood-soaked for being the most vocal critic. Clive threatened to sue him, but saving his business seemed a more worthwhile distraction. Clive battled bravely against the Goliath of bad publicity. He attacked his critics and hired teenagers in several major cities to ride round in C5s all day to help gain public acceptance. Foreign markets were explored. Surely Holland, the most cycle-friendly nation, would embrace this clean future of transport? No. The Dutch government banned the vehicle outright for safety concerns. After £20 million of investment, the C5 just wasn't selling. Here at the Hoover plant, just three months after its launch, the batteries on the C5 finally ran flat. After just producing 10,000 vehicles, production was stopped and the C5 was considered best placed in the museum. When we first received the drawings, they were kept very securely under lock and key in, in the safe, actually. The um, first prototype arrived at Bertha in a very large box and was immediately christened the coffin. Constantly uh, press sniffing around, uh, attempting to take photographs, and indeed one, uh, I think it was the Daily Mirror, one did paper did actually get a shot of the C5, a blurred image of it. Mm. Uh, not that it was going that fast. At what stage was production of the C5 wound down? There's a school of thought which would say it never really wound up. We <laughs> uh, had this capability of, of producing 3,000 on one line. And we never really got up to 3,000. Within a matter of two months, the thing was started and finished. In two months? Two months. There was a sense of failure. It was disappointing. Goodbye to you, my trusted friend. We've known each other since we were nine or ten. Together we've climbed hills and trees Learned of love and ABC Skinned our hearts and skinned our knees Goodbye my friend, it's hard to die On the 4th of November 1985, Sinclair vehicles went into liquidation with 4,500 unsold C5s and a mountain of debt. The sun had finally gone down on the C5 and it had taken everything in close proximity down with it. So my journey was nearing its end. My C5 had done its lap of honour and faithfully taken me with it, but there are still a few loose ends to be tied. The C5 will soon be 20 years old, and what legacy will it leave? A few more stops on my way home, I think. And I ride, and I ride, I ride through the city backsides, I see the stars come out. There isn't anything else like it in the country. Um, they still look incredibly futuristic. I mean, it's a space shuttle without wings. And these days, the roads are a lot more cycle-friendly in a lot of ways. These things suddenly become practical transport if you're, if you're willing to keep one running. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people wanted one when they were kids and they disappeared, and now they're a bit older and they've got the money, and it's, yeah. I mean, a lot of people treat them as fun toys, but to me, it's a perfectly sensible piece of transport. See the bride in an hollow sky I don't think you get missed when you're in a C5. Uh, <laughs> there's no way that people drive past without looking or shouting or waving or making some comments. When I let people have a drive in it, then usually it's just an enormous grin factor and they, they come back, where can you get them from? I want one of these. And, you know, they fall in love with it straight away. You've got a lot of C5s. How many do you have? Uh, it's about six or seven now. I don't think it's obsessive, but... <laughs> Some I people think, might disagree. I think my wife might disagree with that one. But uh, it's not something that I set out to do, it just, it just happened that way. I wouldn't part with them now. My wife would part with them tomorrow, but I, <laughs> there's no way that I'm going to part with them. They are my babies. <laughs> The 
The C5 does what it was always meant to. It moves people. The C5 should never have made it to the market, but by God I'm glad it did. It left people in shock and amazement with its audacity. Nothing embodies the spirit of its creator more. Why do I love it? All I know is that I love it for its shortcomings as much as its successes. For most, the C5 is just a passing memory. But for me and hundreds of others, it's so much more. Long may it struggle at the smallest of things. May the short battery life frustrate eternal. Forever let it hold up lines of traffic. And I hope the Dutch never decriminalise it. Clive's inventions always came right from the heart. And that's exactly where they ended up.